Hey there, guys. Very much and Danny again, this time with William Shea. Uh, he's a vice president in the Cognizant Healthcare Practice. So we're going to be talking a lot about heroics and the new normal in healthcare. And he's doing this from his home office in Miami. So a fellow Floridian, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Bill, good morning. Welcome aboard. Give, me, give us a quick overview of your background. I know you've been in the business a long time. So Tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Vinny. Um, I, I'm, I go by Bill, so I'm Bill Shea. I've been in the healthcare consulting industry for uh, nearly 30 years, always at the intersection of IT and business, um, and, and always in management consulting. But you don't, you don't look so old. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I've been with Cognizant. Uh, since I first joined Cognizant in 2006, and here I lead the payer market segment for the healthcare consulting vertical. Great. Well, so, you know, we've been seeing a lot of heroics and acrobatics in the frontline healthcare, right? God, it's amazing some of the stuff that, at least in the media, we, we, are, we are reporting. You know, we're seeing telemedicine take off. We're seeing clinical trials get accelerated. We're seeing fever pitch, vaccine development, and of course, all the frontline, um, you know, provider acrobatics. You have a front row seat. I just read it from and hear it from my wife, who's also in the psych profession. But you're seeing it firsthand. So tell us about some of the acrobatics. Yeah. Well. It certainly is a moment that's calling for heroics and acrobatics, and we're seeing it across a whole array of dimensions. Uh, one that's top of mind is actually with a large physician group um, that, uh, that I was speaking with earlier this week, um, sort of looking at what they did and how quickly they mobilized to face off against the crisis. And, and as you had mentioned, we're seeing rapid um, shifts and, and adoption of digital. And, and really what they did in a very short period of time was uh, begin to migrate urgent care visits to telehealth. Um, and prior to that, they had virtually no telehealth visits. And so they had to quickly um, you know how all of us have worked from home enabled our workforces. They had to work from home enable their clinical workforce. And so they, they repurposed their IT help desk. They loaded uh, soft, they experimented with a variety of different telehealth software platforms, quickly settled on one, eClinical Works. Um, and, uh, and within a source by March 21st, which is only four days after some of the, the, at least in their market, that the shutdown took place, that they had uh, onboarded all of their PCPs with the software, as well as had conducted simulated e-visits, and are now up to 2,000 e-consults a day across their clinical workforce. For an over 15-day period, they hit 30,000. So wow. a lot of this wasn't, was urgent care, triaging to telehealth for COVID-related symptoms, but also for getting back to their uh, sort of non-COVID-related uh, activities via telehealth um, very quickly. Um, similarly, they mobilized around drive-through services within, within their parking lot, which required them to internet enable uh, or Wi-Fi, create Wi-Fi access outdoors in the parking lot so that they could leverage iPads into people's cars so that they could do e-consults from cars in parking lots. So really quite remarkable, consistent with other things I've heard from health systems and physician organizations in terms of really accelerating uh, e-consults and telehealth. Uh, one other point, just because I, I think it's worth mentioning, it's not, you know, it's not just the uh, frontline caregivers. Organizations like us that serve health plans and health systems had to quickly mobilize as well. And I think I just uh, gave a shout out to Cognizant in terms of the heroics that we actually uh, delivered on in terms of workforce, uh, enabling our workforce in India as well as here uh, to quickly um, uh, pivot and, and become productive in those settings at the same time that our health plan and health system clients were doing the same thing on our end. So it's been a very unique time. Uh, I think a lot of these investments will persist because they're, they'll deliver new types of value to the, the ecosystem post-COVID. Well, thank you for your service, Bill, along with you know thousands of other healthcare professionals. 
And I guess we should thank the government too, right? Telemedicine would not have taken off unless they had relaxed HIPAA rules and Medi uh, Medicare accepting it and so on. Absolutely. But still, it hasn't been all smooth, right? You look at the, you know, you look at setting up the Javits Center as a big hospital and they've already shut it down because there just wasn't enough demand for it. You look at the ups and downs in every state. It seems like the supply chain has been tested. It, it's almost broken, it sounds like, right? Am I sounding a little too negative? It, it just seems like it's been chaotic. Um, well, what's, what's, your, what's your viewpoint? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think it has been chaotic. It has tested the limits of our current business models, as well as care delivery models and funding models uh, in the U.S. And um, I do think that coming out of this, will we'll, there are some bright spots, right? I think that um, in terms of creating community collaboration across competitors, uh, in, terms, in terms of being able to mobilize resources to, to face off against this has, um, has been effective. And I think maybe that, that, uh, that approach to sort of uh, leveraging our care, our ecosystem in a, in a more collaborative way is something that will be important going forward, certainly if there's future pandemics. But I can see other, other value to that as well. Uh, as opposed to the very siloed sort of competitive business models that we've had to date. Um, I also think this, you know, the, developing um, the ability to, to set up pop-up hospitals. I mean, there were, there were trends around micro hospitals and, and pop-up clinical care and so forth, but really doing it at scale, I think we'll be able to find ways to, um, to use that going forward in a post-COVID world in terms of serving rural markets and things like that. Um, but, but, you know, there, there's clearly have been huge challenges in terms of supply chains, but I'm also, you know, tending to look at the bright side. I think one of the, some of the things coming out of this will, I, as I had mentioned before, I think some of this work from home, um, investments will, um, continue to be leveraged, right? I think that we'll find productive ways to do that. And that, that in some ways, if you can get effective and efficient there, that it'll result in lower costs and increased collaboration. Uh, but I think the biggest one is the impact on digital adoption rates. And it goes back to the example I gave before, and I think we'll probably touch on it as we go through our conversation today. But one thing that has happened is everybody has quickly learned how to migrate day-to-day -day processes uh, onto, uh, onto the internet and onto digital platforms. And we used to talk about digital natives pre-COVID, but coming out of you know, 60, 90, 100 days in, uh, in lockdown, all of us are gonna be digital natives. And in our industry, we've spent a lot of money investing in capabilities and pushing them into the digital engagement layer with very low adoption rates. And I think this is gonna quickly change that. So there are some bright spots amidst, uh, you know, all of the, the sort of challenges and the testing of the system and the breaking of the system at points that we can learn from, I think, and will drive value in the future. Well, one of the things I've been talking to some policy level folks, right? And they are actually excited that, you know, this industry has been, has, it's become one fifth of the GDP, right? It's huge, it's inefficient, it's bureaucratic. They're excited that they're seeing new entrants, right? So when GM and Ford jump in to make medical ventilators or when 3M says, I'm gonna quadruple N95 masks, or when Amazon, Google, and Apple say, they're going to get serious about healthcare. At least some policymakers are excited about that. What 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 do you I mean? What do you think of new entrants, and you know what does that mean for cognizance business? Yeah. So so I think it has accelerated a trend that was already happening. Right. There were a lot of new entrants jumping into healthcare um, for a while now, and you know it, it sort of brings to mind this you know example. A phrase we used to talk about that all healthcare companies, all companies were pivoting to become technology companies. In healthcare, that was the case as well. I had very few large clients that weren't diversifying into tech and what have you. And even pre COVID, it, there was a significant percentage of the Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 who had healthcare strategies, right? There was uh, a lot of industry focus and diversification strategies 
into this sector. Um, I would certainly say right now in, in the, this particular moment, we're seeing some uh, new entrants that I ha certainly hadn't anticipated, some of which you had mentioned, but others like Carnival Cruise Lines jumping into the hospital business right. or some of these other sorts of folks that they're, they're clearly leaping well beyond adjacent industries into ours. Um, so it'll, it'll be, um, I'll be curious to see how that plays out. But what I'm seeing is that prior to COVID, there were a set of what I think of as in-flight um, trends that, 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 were, that healthcare was facing off against and that they were driving the spending and investment priorities of my clients. And COVID has accelerated though so in, in a number of ways. So we'll, I'll touch on a number of them briefly, but we've talked about digital health, right? So clearly this whole event has been an accelerator uh, for the pivot to digital. And that's re readjusting a number of priorities. But I would also say that it has accelerated the trend towards value-based care, right? So in healthcare, there's been a real shift to value-based payments, payment based on outcomes. The provider community has been quickly reorganizing and mobilizing in order to be able to create sustainable business models underneath value-based care. And as it turns out, the uh, the provider those providers that were most um, engaged in value based models are the ones that are coming out of the current pandemic uh, the best right so fee for service providers are getting hit the hardest because fee for service is fee for volume and the deferment of elective procedures has put them in a very financially challenging environment so I, I think this will also accelerate the path towards value based care. Um, Additionally, we, all, we were seeing consolidation uh, and M&A in our industry pre-COVID, but I think as we come out of this, we're going to see the acceleration of consolidation. There'll be distressed properties clearly on the care delivery side, but it, even on the how about, side. How about on the, on the payer side too? I think on the payer side, we'll see some of the smaller payers and some of the regional players rethinking their business models and, and their strategies. I think that... Um, I think the advantage does skew a little bit to the, the larger, more diversified healthcare conglomerates is what I think of them as, that the ones that have um, their diversified horizontal and vertical diversification, you know, sort of like uh, you know, United Health Group Optum, CBS Health, um, Anthem and Cigna and others like that are diversified across lines of business. So, you know, risk of uh, unemployment in their commercial business, they can pick up in Medicaid. So it, to me, it, it just pe people who doubled down on diversification strategies, which everybody was going in that direction pre COVID anyway, if you were in multiple lines of business, people were looking to get there, but the advantage now has skewed, skewed in that direction. So I think we'll see a, a spike in M&A and, and as well as um, horizontal and vertical diversification. And then also co cost optimization. So I'm seeing it already, right? There are come in right now, there's a lot of organizations both on the payer side and the provider side that are experiencing uh, unprecedented cost pressure. And so looking at ways to take to automate or optimize or, or rationalize or modernize in the near term to get savings to face off against either the spiking claims expected to defer from the deferred utilization or just the cost pressures on the provider side of having to um, uh, stop performing elective procedures and get that income are gonna uh, increase spend there. So I, in some ways I think, uh, and, and as a vendor, as a key supplier to this industry, frankly, that's a little bit of what we're experiencing is that there's renewed um, focus on some of the strategies that folks were beginning to go down, but now it's become a bit more urgent. You know, so to your point about everybody was trending towards becoming, every company was becoming a technology company, right? I've heard in the last month, three different perspectives. One is every company is going to be a healthcare company going forward. I've heard the HR, HCM, HC, Chief Human Resources Officer will increasingly become the Chief Medical Officer, right? And then I've heard, no way, it's gonna be a completely science-based medical professional who's gonna have a C-level position. Are you seeing any trends early on in your client base? Well, um... 
I mean, I think in terms of, um, I, I think there will be some fundamental changes there. I, I think in terms of the um, new entrants, right? In terms of, um, you know, that threatening existing business models for my clients. I think that is real, but I think this event has also um, made us appreciate the value of incumbency, right? So the, for those organizations that really have been heavily invested and, and rooted in healthcare, um, that yeah, I think pre-COVID people thought new entrants, you know, some of the big tech players jumping into our industry could really be disruptive and, and threaten the existence, the existential threats to some of the bigger players. And I think now the value of incumbency and understanding the, compl the regulatory complexities of our industry, as well as the very complicated supply chains, just the, the, the whole care continuum uh, in and of itself, from wellness to uh, chronic to acute care to, to home care, whatever, isn't, um, isn't that easy to jump into, right? So I think, I think coming out of this, that, that a lot of the legacy players um, will, you know, will be positioned for advantage. But that said, I think there's significant, um, you know, there's still, the, the big tech players are still um, really significant threats, right? So, and, and, and there's something that my current clients are still quite nervous about. What are, what are the plays that Google, Amazon, and Apple are going to do here? So Bill, let's, let's talk about technology. Um, I'm hearing from a number of customers across sectors that their cloud applications are much easier to support in a work from home environment, right? Healthcare seems to be, you know, a lot of stuff is still on mom's operating system. You got the Epics and the Cerners that are 30, 40, 50 years old. You got insurance claims that are, God, 100 years old, right? What, what have you found in your business? Was this uh, more on-prem model, was it challenged during this time or did they cope reasonably well? Um, they've, they've been challenged, right? So I think they're the, I talked about some of the investment trends that existed pre-COVID um, that are getting accelerated. Uh, um, as a result of this event. And I think one of those is this shift to the cloud and shift to platform modernization um, and, and an appreciation for the fact that going forward in order to have sustain, you know, business continuity and sustainable business models that, um, that cloud, cloud models are gonna make sense. Um, but also getting to truly um, more agile and nimble um, platforms is going to be required. So uh, in our industry, on the payer side, uh, as well as the provider side, on the payer side, there's a lot of folks that are heavily invested in legacy applications that, um, that currently don't allow them to uh, access data sets and, and you know, sort of do this, uh, get the value out of health intelligence that is going to be required going forward and even to sustain interoperability, um, uh, not, not just for the mandate, but just in terms of drive value out of data that we're seeing, I'm seeing a renewed appreciation in investing in platform modernization, data modernization, and cloud migration strategies. It's, there's no doubt about it. it the things that, the conversations that, um, that really uh, picked up quickly after folks got through the, the heat of the moment around uh, work from home enabling their workforces and their vendors were conversations related to what I just mentioned. What about your business? How have you adapted to, you know, people say, uh, work from home, limited travel? It's, you know, it seems like the consulting model has been ripe for that for 20 years, but has always resisted that. We'd like to be at the site and so on. You know, I heard one of your competitors say they don't see more than 25% going back to any office anywhere in the world, right? Which is a dramatic statement for an outsourcing firm. What are you yeah. finding? What do you think is going to be next year or two? Is your model going to evolve? Yeah, so, you know, I was reading an interesting statistic, not specific to my industry, but it was just overall that 75% of the um, 
uh, companies that have you know quickly worked from home enabled their their teams and workforces um, expect that a significant portion of that or some meaningful portion of that will remain working from home and I think that that will um, that will happen from on, on our side as well right I mean it's a significant investment that's made and if folks can be productive and effective and leverage you know some of the collaborative um, uh, software that that we're all beginning to become proficient in and in some ways it's forced us to to um, to adopt some of these collaborative sort of uh, uh, software that people resisted before so I think that I think there's some some new work patterns that will evolve and people will prefer them and so uh, even in consulting which is you know in consulting uh, we, we've been able to migrate to a remote model you know for a lot of the work right but there, there's still a lot of consulting that is best done on site in terms of you know knowledge transition and actually just viewing how work gets done uh, and i think we'll find creative in fact in the immediate term we have found some creative ways to do that um, and we're going to have to continue to do that because i don't see all of us frankly getting on planes or being welcomed inside of client environments um, in person uh, and mass anytime soon. Uh, but it does create challenges for the business model. So I mean, in terms of executing consulting engagements uh, is one thing, right? But I think we can, we can work through that. I think there's challenges around relationship building, right? In terms of, you know, the, not just the sales cycle and the business development cycle, but building that, um, you know, to, uh, how to credential yourself in front of clients and, and develop trust and become a trusted advisor. We're going to have to learn how to do that um, via, you know, um, WebEx. Uh, and, and Bill, you know. Bill, here's something encouraging. I had the CEO of an ERP company, software company. Now they sell to the mid market, but he said he he closed two deals in March without once setting foot as a client. You know how ERP software takes months to sell. I was yes. I was impressed that they sold it through Zoom and Zoom demos and other online. So there's hope. <laughs> oh yeah, yep, yeah. yeah. And when and we're doing it. Um, so it's it's but it's been a quick a quick migration and pivot to to these new you know platforms for selling and executing uh, consulting, but and and maintaining ongoing customer relationships without being there in person. Frankly, I'm looking forward to. I think like everybody else to a time when we can uh, maybe not go back to, you know, to, to exactly the way we were. People keep talking about the new normal or the new abnormal, but it's uh, hopefully it's something that's a little bit more of a hybrid where we can be in front of our clients in person more often. So I interviewed a mid seventies VC last week, pretty prominent. And he said, hey, I'm looking forward to not going to a single, he's on several boards, not going to a single board meeting if I can avoid it. Warren Buffett presented last week at 89 and he, you know, he did a webcast for his annual meeting and he said, Hey, look, it's the first time I'm using slides in my life. And my long-term partner, Charlie Munger is 96. He's not with me, but he's become a zoom fanatic. So there's hope for all of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like I said, I think that we'll all be digital natives pretty soon. Uh, and we'll all be growing uh, beards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. A, let's go back to the healthcare industry. So, you know, in some ways, this has exposed, this whole crisis has exposed that we pay so much for healthcare. And yet, you know, the results are turning out to be uh, pretty shocking, right? In spite of all the heroics. On the other hand, we've learned so much in the last two months that it would seem like an exciting time. You know, where, where, what, where, do, you, where do you come at it? Are you, are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Where are you falling on this? So, um, so I tend to be more optimistic about it. Um, I, you know, for a while, um, at, uh, at least within Cognizant Healthcare Consulting, we've been espousing this point of view around on-demand healthcare and how and how that may dramatically disrupt current business models both on the health plan and care delivery side and 
there's been a lot of reasons why you know, that on-demand approach to, to medical services has been a challenge to deliver, but we, we've seen you know, the classic examples in other industries where on-demand platforms like Uber and iTunes and Amazon have drastically changed the supply and demand equation. And for and most of my clients, we've done a number of future mapping workshops with senior executives at health plans across the U.S. and health systems, and they all agree that this industry is not immune from some sort of disruptive platform play that that supports this on-demand, um, what leveraging, uh, you know, internet and virtual settings for care, and um, and then begins to change how, you know, what what a viable health plan or health system business model begins to look like. And I see, I see opportunities for really um, fundamental reimagining of how healthcare is delivered coming out of this. It won't be, um, people will be much more open to that. And I think some of the things that have been forced uh, on us through COVID uh, in terms of quickly uh, adapting to digital care, as well as uh, internet enabling our homes and, and accelerating the path towards uh, the uh, you know, hospital at home or re leveraging remote patient monitoring devices. And also the shift to alternative settings, not just internet settings, but you know, there's been this trend towards retail healthcare uh, uh, Walmart's going there, CVS, um, and, and what we sometimes at, in, in our thought leadership refer, refer to as McHealth, right, that, that really, you know, conveniently accessing uh, care via in new settings, that's already getting accelerated with drive-through care. CVS was quick to convert its parking lots into, um, you know, testing centers and drive through So I, I think we'll continue to see the, the demand and appreciation for new ways of accessing healthcare that'll really challenge um, the, the old legacy mindset, right? So I'm optimistic that this, this is a, a sort of the theme, I guess, of my remarks today is that um, despite how dark the, the actual uh, COVID pandemic is, the, some of the behavior responses will ultimately may lead to longer term changes that'll be good um, for folks in terms of cost of care, access to care, satisfaction of care, and so forth. Well, Bill, once again, thank you so much for your service. You know, I say that on behalf of all the citizens and your fellow healthcare professionals and looking forward to all the changes. You know, I think, I think the people are ready for change. So you know, turn your optimism into action. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Vinny. Appreciate it. Thank you. Stay safe. You too.